Okay, well, good evening to everybody. Let's take our King James Bible and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'm going to read verse number 1. Good. We, we could stand up, Frank. Let's stand up real quick. Out of, let's, let's reverence the Word of God. Let's stand up. Let's read this one verse. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Starting at verse number 1. I'm just going to read that one verse. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits in doctrines of devils. So if I had a title for this evening's message, it would be The Last Generation. I want to talk about The Last Generation. I only pray. Dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that you speak to the hearts of the hearers here this evening. I just pray that we may focus on your word. Uh, just please block out any distraction. Please take away any, uh, anything that may be troubling us or any concerns and cares that are in our heart. Lord, please cast them aside as we try to focus on your word here tonight and that you may bless what is being preached. Lord, I just give you all the preeminence in everything that we do and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can be seated. So, now I believe that we are living in the last generation and for those of you who were born in the year 2000, and on, I believe that's the last generation before the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. Uh, I could be wrong, but I, I sure hope I'm not. Uh, how many people? How many people were born in the year 2000 in here? After 2000, Jordan, Danielle, Luke. Okay, a couple. We just, you just squeaked in 99. Who just squeaked in in the 99s? You got 97. Just just making it. But I believe people that born after 2000. That's probably the last generation before the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. Now, this generation that we're going to talk about has certain marks to it, okay? And we just read some of these things, some of the marks of it, and what we just read there. Look at, look at it again, verse number 1, 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. All right, now, that, you know, this is pretty rare in a way. This is the, the Holy, this is where Paul, I was just reading Paul, you know, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, you know, he says, when he gives this whole admonition on, uh, what was it about? might have been about like marriage, I think it was about. And Paul says, I think I have the Spirit of God also. He does, or else it wouldn't have been in the, in the Holy Bible. But here, this is a direct thing Paul's saying, now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Now, you know, this obviously isn't Paul's opinion. This is the Holy Spirit of God speaking expressly. That just means plainly, clearly. Okay, very easy to understand here. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, okay, the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. All right, there's, there's one, Mark. People are going to depart from the faith. You know, you, you see that everywhere. I used to believe. I used to go to church. I used to read the Bible. I used to do this. I used to, you know, be interested in Jesus Christ and God and all that. And now I said, forget about it, you know, type of thing. Some shall depart from the faith. That's a trait. That's, that's one of the marks in the last generation before the Lord comes back. Giving heed. Giving heed. That's paying attention to. Giving heed to seducing spirits in doctrines of devils. To give heed to seducing spirits, that pretty much means that they have no spiritual discernment at all. No spiritual discernment. People nowadays, they just walk around like, you know, duh, and just like walk on text on their phone and just nobody's thinking. Just walking around, just, just, just blinded. No spiritual discernment. Uh, and, you know, they may claim that they may, you may hear this, you may hear, well, yeah, but I'm spiritual. You know, well, that means nothing, actually. The, the devil himself is spiritual. The devil himself is religious, so that's not good enough. I'm spiritual, I'm religious. That's not good enough. The devils and demons are religious, too, so you can't go with that. In this generation we live in, they're quick to pick up some, you know, rock that they found or, or spend $5 in, on some stone at some witchcraft store and carry it in their pocket like it's some lucky charm. And, and yet they won't open up this Bible for spiritual help. You know, well, you know, they're, they're, they're open up their horoscope and they read for guidance. Why don't they want to open up their, why don't they want to open up the Holy Bible, the Holy Scriptures for help? What are they, what are they scared of? When you think of it, what are, you, what are you scared of? Well, I know what they're scared of. They're scared of getting convicted of their sin. That's what they're scared of. And paganism, that doesn't convict you of your sin. 
Uh, but this book does. The, the King James Bible, the Word of God, this book convicts you of your sin. And they kind of hide from they kind of hide from it like criminals hide from the police. Okay? And, and they, they think, as long as I don't get caught, I'll be all right. Well, you can hide from the police all you want. Okay? You could, you could, you could do something in your life, or get, get, away, get away, do a crime, and hide from them your entire life and get away with it. But you cannot hide from God. You can't. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, beholding the good and the evil. They're everywhere. And, uh, and judgment day is going to come. And if your record isn't perfectly clear, you're going to get tossed into the bottomless pit. You're going to get tossed into hell, which is a fiery prison. And uh, you, gotta, you, know, you say, well, how do I get my record cleared since I'm a sinner? We're all sinners. We all sin. Past, present, and future, we, we continually sin. Sin is in our, is in our members, it members. It's in our extremities. We're sinners. So how do we get a perfect record? You've got to receive the perfect record of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, in, in, in place of yours, you've got to receive the payment. Okay, the payment's there, but you've got to take it by faith. You've got to trust it by faith to really, you know, kind of cash in on the payment. So what is this payment? Well, the Bible says you've got to trust in the finished works of the Lord Jesus Christ. What are his finished works? He died for my sins on the cross. He was buried. He resurrected the third day. He lived a life that I couldn't live. He took the sins of the world upon him. Blood, sweat, and tears into a free gift. God stretches forth his arms and says, here, you want it or not? You want to take it or don't you want to take it? It's up to you. God, don't hold a gun to your head and say, this was, it's a free gift by, by free will. And you've got to take it by faith and say, yes, Lord, I'll take it. It's, it's, I'll take it as mine and I'll trust solely on what you did for me. And uh, you come to Christ as a sinner and he gives you the record of a saint. You come to Christ and his perfect record gets placed over top of your filthy record and your filthy record gets placed on top of him when he died at Calvary. It's, a, it's an amazing deal. You can't, you can't pass it up. And uh, I was uh, talking to a guy at the car wash, an employee. I was cleaning the back of my you know, magnetic bumper stickers I got. And he came to fill one of the bottles of a car cleaner. And he said, What's your, what, are your, what does bumper stickers say? And I said, you want, here. I said, why don't you read them? And I pulled out the one I have first. Uh, and, it says, and he's reading it. He said, how shall ye escape the damnation of hell? Okay, question mark. That's a, that's a great verse in Matthew. And I have that right above, not, not even knowing, I have a Ford Escape. <laughs> and it, right above it is, how shall ye escape the damnation of hell? That's, one, that's, that's part one. And, uh, and I said, do you know the answer to that one? Do you know the answer? He says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I said, all right, well, here, let's read the other one. And the other one says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Acts chapter 16. You know, and, he's, uh, and, he, and he said, uh, what did he say? He said, it may. He said, it almost seems too easy. You know, and I'm like, hey, yeah. I said, that's exactly it. <laughs> God, if God would have made it any harder, everybody would wind up in hell. If you had to do this and do that and do this and work your way to heaven, nobody would make it because we're all sinners. We all fail every single day. So God came down to his planet and did everything for us. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's the, he, he gave us the way of salvation for, you know, what he did on the cross and his resurrection. And then you know, I guess the guy he always said was, yeah, he said, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I'm agreeing with you. I said, I said, where, where, where are you going to go when you die? And he says, I don't know. I'm not sure. I said, we just, we just read it. <laughs> we, just, we just read it. And it's like, man, you know, you think of the blindness that the devil has. The devil just got him just, just bound. We, li we literally just read, how shall you escape the damnation of hell? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. And he laughed a little bit and said, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Said, what did he say? He said, Jesus, you know, uh, Jesus Christ. I said, yeah, I said, when you get home, you know, read this track and just gave him a track. But so the, what I believe is this is, the, this is the last generation before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And there's certain marks to it that we can observe uh, and that, that lets us know things are getting ready to wrap up, okay? So let's look at 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse number 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Apostle Paul, he's writing this. He says, This know also. This know. I always, I always circle that word know in my Bible. A, a Christian has no room to be an agnostic. A Christian has uh, things that we're supposed to know. Okay, Th This know also. God gives us plenty of warnings. Okay, We, we can't claim ignorance to certain things that uh, he, he clearly told us. So this know... Also, that in the last days, 
perilous times shall come. Okay, perilous, that's dangerous, that's, that's hazardous, that's risky. All right, that's what the definition is. Risk, risk, risky of what? What are, we, what are we risking? Risky of falling into the grouping here. We don't want to be a part of the group that we're about to look at here. And, and it's, it's risky business here. It's dangerous, hazardous times. Okay, look what it says. Perilous times shall come in the last days. Paul's clearly not talking about the days he's living and He's talking about a certain time period. And he's saying these things shall come. Now, it was bad back in Paul's day. It was Christians getting lit up like torches. That's where they get Roman candles, you know, burning Christians on the side of the road, lighting them up for just persecuting them left and right, sawing them in half, cutting them in half, uh, you know, wrapping them in, in animal skins and things and, going, you know, telling them to go out into the woods and they get devoured by, by animals and things. And Paul ended up dying. Uh, he ended up getting his head chopped off as... as uh, I guess history would tell you, he ended up getting his head cut off uh, from Emperor Nero. Every apostle in the early church, uh, they died in that way. They died as, as martyrs, okay? It was bad times in, in, for Christians. It was, it was horrible times. And, uh, but he says, what Paul says here is there's a particular time, okay, a time period, the last days where things are going to be off the charts of wickedness, just off the charts. All right, we'll look at a couple of these things here. Verse number two, it says this, okay? So where do, where does the, what are the marks of the last generation? Well, number one, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. You see that? Lovers of their own selves. And you heard it before, but it, I think it's a good illustration for this, this uh, uh, expounding this verse. Selfie. <laughs> I mean, think, think about it. That's a relatively new term in what is a selfie. It's, it's, it's you taking a picture of yourself, and it's it just... To just sum it all up, the last generation is just self-obsessed. Clear as that's just what it is. Self-obsessed, narcissistic, only can, me, me, me. Just all about me, and just you know, just, that's what it is. It's it's men shall be lovers of their own selves. Okay, a self-obsessed generation. Okay, the next one is covetousness. Okay, covetous. Want, want, want. You know, that's what, desiring things that you don't have, okay? And that's just, that's what covetous is. And we, you could obviously see that in the last days with the rise of commercialism. That's, that's really what commercials are designed for is to get you to covet things that you don't really need. You know, oh, look at this, you know, brand new, you know, truck or whatever, you know, with trucks going over mountains and doing all these things. I got a truck that gets me to work there and back, I'm fine. <laughs> Well, you know, and you, you, you look at these little tools or look at this brand new sweeper, you know, it does a 360 pivot, does all these things or whatever. We've got a sweeper that works fine. You know, commercials are designed to get you to covet things that you really don't actually need. <laughs> that's, what, that's what commercials do. It's, it's, it's a whole business. They make money off you, just people just coveting things, desiring things. So that's a mark in the last days, covetous. How about this one? Boasters. All right, boasters. And no, nobody boasts more than sports players in this day and age. Nobody boasts more. And uh, they, it, you know, they, they actually practice their, their touchdown celebrations. They practice <laughs> these things. And, uh, you know, you, you probably heard it, but, you know, do you know why they actually call it a touchdown? Yeah, because back in the day, the, the, the guy would go across the goal line. And they get it from rugby or whatever, and they would actually have to take the ball and touch it down into the opponent's end zone. And then they'd get up and then they hand it to the referee and, you know, okay, everything would be fine. And, uh, but nowadays, you know, it's like they, they go into the end, the end zone, they make a big show, they're showboating, they're boasting. That's all it really comes down to. You know, they get the whole team involved, everybody's jumping up and down and, you know, doing weird, crazy stuff. It's, they do, they do re rehearsed celebrations just for doing their job. That's the job. You're paid, to, you're paid to get the ball in the end zone. You do your job. Okay, that's it. You know, that would be like me. You know, hey, watch me. I'm going to pound this nail in. You know, look at me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pound this nail in right now. You know, everybody check me out. I'm going to get this thing in three strikes, you know. And I pound it in. And I, I walk around. I'm like, yeah, you know, look at me. I'm throwing my hammer down, taking my tool belt off and waving around in the air and stuff like that. Like we're, people would be looking up like, look, look at this guy. Just, just shut up and do your job. Pound the nail in and frame. Look, I'm the best framer in the world. You know, look at me. Like, it's it's boasting. Why why do you got to boast, right? Why do we got to boast? And that's that's a mark of the last days. Covetous boasters. 
And look what comes right along with that. Proud. Okay, proud. That's all across the board. You know, nobody's like me. You know, I'm the... I'm the best there is type of type of attitude, you know, and it, just a, a proud bunch of people walking around with their nose stuck up, no humility, no humbleness, just a proud generation. And I, uh, you know, just the, I always like you know the, the thing of, of looking at speeches back from the old days, how they would always give glory back to God if the Lord will, if God will, you know, by the grace of God. Now it's just I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to fix the border, I'm going to get the taxes back. I'm going to lower gas prices. God's name isn't anywhere in their speeches. <laughs> it's just all about me, me, I, I. that type of, that proud mentality. If that's everywhere. Then you got the next, the next trademark thing is blasphemers. Now, blasphemers. Just look at the word Jesus Christ being used as a cuss word. Okay? I tried figuring out, when did this even start? This Je when did they start using Jesus Christ as a cuss word? The uh, closest thing I could come up in the research is, Around the 18, late 1800s of Mark Twain, well, one, one writer, uh, I guess, wrote about people you know, using it as a cuss word. But think about that. Blasphemy is just going to be on a rise. Okay? And, and there, there's, there's no religion out there in the world, that, in America, that really gets persecuted and, and blasphemed like Bible-believing Christianity does. You know, they got them satanic marches and stuff like that. And you know, Marilyn Manson, he's eating pages of the Bible. <laughs> He's, he's crumbling, he's ripping the Bible up, and these people at the satanic conventions, they're pulling pages out of the Bible. They're not, they're not messing with Buddhism. They're not messing with Islam. They're not messing with Confucianism. Or, they're attacking Christianity. The devil got all them other people duped as it is. He ain't wasting time with that. He's wasting time with the truth. That's what the devil is out, and he wants to attack. People blaspheme God. They use Jesus' name as a cuss word. Who's Jesus Christ? That's God that flung out the universe. God manifests in the flesh. Why would you use his precious and holy name as a cuss word? You know, why not use the word Muhammad or oh, Buddha? Or Because subconsciously people want to curse God. We're all born in sin. We have a sinful heart. The heart is desperately wicked, deceitful, and all that. And it, it, it wants to curse God. So that's one of the first words you hear about, you know, just they just use Jesus Christ as a, as a cuss word. It's blasphemy. Okay, that's a mark of the last days. Blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. All right, you just go back 60 years ago. It, you know, kids, kids wouldn't even dare to, to speak in the, while, while adult, adults were even talking. My grandma always told me the, the old saying was, you know, seen but not heard. Okay, and adults, when adults are sitting at the table, a kid would come in the room, they, they don't, all right, look at me, look at me, and it just automatically all the attention wants to go back on, on to them. Back then, I guess kids might have had more respect. At least that's what my grandma told me. They, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't dare talk back to mom or dad, and if they did, they would end up getting a whooping or a beating or however they discipline their kids and things. And nowadays, you know, kids run their mouths, they roll the house, and parents, they have no control over their kids. And it's just on a rise, you know. And uh, you hear, just take his little iPad or whatever and, and, or take his phone and just, instead of raising him and teaching him and trying to raise him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and things, just, they, they're, they're, so that kid ends up being disobedient to his parents. So, on the last days, that's, a, that's one that you could check at, Mark. You're going to see that. Disobedient to parents. Then you go down the list. Here's another one. Unthankful. Unthankful. For what? Unthankful for food. Unthankful for water. Unthankful for conveniences. Unthankful for electricity. We lost our electricity yesterday for about an hour. And we're like, oh, what are we going to do? I'm going to have to grill. I'm going to have to heat up my tea on the fire now or whatever. Like, thinking, man, you know, we lost electricity for one hour, and we're already starting to get it, oh, man, you know, I'm starting to sweat a little, what are we going to do, what we, what, you know, and it made me, and it did make me think, I, I was thinking, oh, it's going to come back on, you know, and it did, but what a blessing we take for granted, electricity, we have an electric stove, I was trying to tell her this, see, if we had a gas stove, we could light the gas, we could cook dinner, <laughs> electric stove, it's easier to clean, I, I, I know, I know, but, you know, uh, electricity, Okay, the, the, our refrigerator. We take the, uh, I'm thankful for air conditioning, heating, cooling, vehicles. We got a job. How many of us got a job? That's a blessing. <laughs> you know, uh, all that stuff. And, and, and pe people, do these, you know, people do these things. And do you think they actually take the time in their day to actually thank God for any of those things? They don't. Christians barely thank you, Lord, for, you know, I like, you know, thank you for waking me up this morning. Thank you for 
food, the water, the clothing, everything I got, you know, so, you know, they, they said, well, I got it all, I worked hard for everything I got, you know, I did this and I did that, well, that, that all goes back to pride, you see what happens when you become prideful, what, what's, it, what's it go to, it, it evolves into unthankfulness, you know, I'm proud, I'll do it all myself, <laughs> you know, who, who's, who's air are we breathing right now, God's air, whose water are we drinking right now, who's, you know, who, whose food did we eat? Wh whose elements did we use to make whatever we were making to make a living? God's. It all comes from God. And people, we're living in a very unthankful generation. Okay, next one, it, it says unholy. Another big one. Okay, you know, think it, holy, holy living. People say, yeah, yeah, right. You know, who, who, people in this generation, they know nothing about holiness, nor do they care to know anything about holiness. They don't care. Now, you say you, you may say this. You may say, well, we're not in the last generation. You can apply all those traits to every generation. Not so. Okay, not so. Look at this, look at this next one. And this is a real tell, this is a real telltale sign that we're in the last days. Last days have come, okay? Paul said perilous time shall come. I believe these days, these days have come. We're right in the, we're right at the end of the thing. Last generation. Look at look at the rest of verse three, or uh, the first thing in verse three, without natural affection. Okay, that's that's not just talking about just any sin. That's talking about something that is unnatural is going to be going on in the last generation. Okay, Paul says in the last days they don't have natural affection. So in America, you know, a young girl, she gets knocked up by fooling around with, with some punk or whatever, and she's, she doesn't want the responsibility of taking care of a child, okay, for, the, for what she did. You know, you, you ended up sleeping with this guy, and now you have a responsibility to take care of this kid. Well, no, I don't want to, so I'll, I'll just go to the clinic or whatever, and I'll, I'll kill it. I'll just kill it. I'll kill it in the womb, or I'll kill it when it comes out of the womb. I'll do whatever, I'll, it's, and I'll, I'll, kill, I'll kill my kid. It's, it's not natural for a mother of a child to want to kill a baby of hers that she's nurturing. It's unnatural, all right? Regardless of how, how that baby came in you, whatever, it's an innocent life. It, it is an innocent life. It's innocent. That baby didn't do nothing. That baby had no, you know, uh, had not, not, no idea about your, your sin or whatever like that. It's innocent. And I, I like Isaiah 49, verse 15. You can write this down. I ain't going to read it. But God says this, Can a woman forget her sucking child? that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? The Lord says, Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. So the Lord's talking about how great his love is. It's not natural to forget about your sucking child. It's not natural. And the Lord does say, he says, Yea, they may forget, okay, and it's not normal to forget about your sucking child. But God even says, Yea, they may forget, but then he says, uh, But I won't forget you, because I'm not like them, okay? I'm not like them at all. I won't forget my children that are crying out to me. Whereas, you know, mothers and parents, they forget about their kids. And they don't, they don't care about them. It's, uh, that's unnatural. All right, here's another one. It's, it's not natural to sit behind some computer screen and watch two people fornicate. People are living in a, in a fantasy world. You know, what, here's the stat. One out of every three young adults have watched porn in the last month. One out of three. And another one. 69% of American men and 40% of American women view pornography regularly. Regularly, 69% of men, 40% of women watch this stuff regularly. What is, that's, what is that? It's unnatural. <laughs> unnatural. But right behind Google, uh, YouTube, Facebook, the fourth visited site is a porn site on the, on the Internet. Out of everything you could be looking up and researching and learning about, you know, the, okay, the internet may have some good things to learn and study or whatever. Visiting a, the, the, the site, it's a porn site. It's the fourth biggest site. That stuff, it warps your brain. It causes anxiety. It causes depression. It causes, it causes serious marriage troubles, divorce. Uh, you know, and with these stats it was looking up, the age just keeps getting lower and lower. Because why? Because uh, you give a teenager... A phone. They got the they got the world in the palm of their hands. What are they going to do with it? They could look at any filthy, ungodly thing they want to. At a at a young age, starting them out at starting them out at eight years old. Here's a cell phone, and then they're watching weird stuff or whatever. TikTok. Start them out. They'll be watching that stuff at eleven years old. 
if they on the on the on the road that they're they're going through. You know, here's a young a young teenager going through puberty, hormones changing, and you're going to give them the phone and they can watch anything that they want to watch. No, no holds bars type stuff. So how do, how how do we know we're living in the last days? People are without natural affection. They're addicted to pornography, and it's un it's unnatural to to watch what you're watching there on the screen. <laughs> It's it's that's not natural. I didn't intend that uh, intend for that to on to see the stuff on on computer screens and stuff. It's unnatural. And if there's if there's Christian men watching this stuff or whatever, you got to repent. You got to you got to ask God, Lord, make make this stuff just vile to my eyes. Make make me actually be disgusted in in this thing here. Okay, I don't, make, make it like, like and it's, that's what's important about quoting Scripture. David said, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. David said that. Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes, an agreement with my eyes. He says, why then should I think upon a maid? I made a covenant with my eyes. Uh, what's another one? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Another one is, uh, be, be not partakers of their evil deeds. You say, well, I'm not, I'm not going out there fornicating. Yeah, but you're watching it. It's just as bad. Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already with her in his heart. It's, it's just as worse. You're partaking of their, of their evil deeds. Okay, and you, you cl clicking on that. Who knows where, who's getting paid for all that, for that clicks and stuff. It's a whole big, then you're, then you're supporting child pedophilia and all that. It's a, it's a dark, dark thing. Okay, so it's, it's, and it's not natural. All right, so nature teaches you another thing without natural affection. Nature itself teaches you that same-sex marriage is not right. Well, how does nature teach you that? Because the two aren't compatible. It's just that simple. All right, and it's a form of perversion to fulfill your sexual and sensual desires. That's sin. And, uh, it, you know, if it was right to be a homo or a lesbian, if that was actually right, God would have produced in both genders the ability to reproduce if that was right you know and put all of them on one island what happens to their what happens to their their what happens to the bunch of perverts put them all on one island and in a hundred years everybody will become extinct so so lgbtq movement it's a it's a it's a pro genocide movement and it's sneaky it's genocide killing your own people sterilization for having two men together they can't reproduce two women together you're killing your own people it's crazy it's a sexual perversion. Now, in the, midst of, in the midst of all this forms of sexual perversion, here's another unnatural affection. Artificial intelligent girlfriends. Okay, AI girlfriends. You know, I think of, you know, honey, I love you, all robotic and stuff like that. You know, like, just like, what, what, what is this? You know, the, and it's, it all starts from, it's weird stuff. Because the, the perverts, they're, they're hooked on pornography, and they can't muscle up any confidence to actually talk to a real woman. So what do they do? They end up going to these, they call them chatbots. And they're talking to, they're, they're, ta they're talking to a chatbot. <laughs> you know, we're in the last days, okay? And I could park here all night long, but re remember, that uh, Jesus says, As the days of Noah, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Okay? As the days of Lot, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Noah and Lot. In Noah's time, you had uh, angels coming down, sleeping with, with women. In Lot's day, you had men trying to sleep with angels. I mean, just weird, perverted stuff. 2024, we got men talking to computers. They're going to start sleeping with their AI girlfriends somehow. <laughs> Dolls or whatever in a, in a robot. What is, it's not natural. So this thing is, we could take this thing to another level. That's one of the... The sure marks that we're living in perilous times. And you see, just a, just a generation ago, if I were to say everything I just talked about, the previous generation would look at me like, what are you, you, you're on some sci-fi stuff. You know, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, no, this stuff is it's a reality now. The last generation had, wouldn't have even imagined what I was just speaking about. They couldn't even imagine it. And yet we're living on it, okay? We're living in it. Okay, so the list continues. Without natural affection, we ain't going to spend any more time much with this list. Truce breakers, there's a big one. Nobody can keep their word anymore. Back in the day, it used to just be a handshake, yeah, I'll be there. You got my word for it. What, what's, what's your word nowadays mean? <laughs> Nothing. Yeah, I'll be there. Uh, there's a big one. Work, jobs. 
Yeah, I'll be there at 6 o'clock in the morning, you know. Uh, I see, where's the new guy? Where's he at? I didn't show up this morning, you know. How many people, it works like a revolving door. You see, in the restaurant field, you can't keep a guy, a cook, any longer than a week or a day. They, they Two days, you know. They get through so many people. works like a revolving door. And then they don't even say anything. They just leave. We just... Even even older people, I said I, I can understand our generation, you know, our, us millennials, no show, you know, we're we're messed up as it is. But these are like 50, 50 year olds and forty year olds, they don't even give their boss what happened to two weeks notice and stuff, just truce breakers, you know. And they everything got to be in contracts and things like that, and nobody's well, their words are meaningless. Okay, next one, false accusers, accusing people left and right falsely, in in con, incontinent. Meaning they're not content with what they have, so they that they want to covet more things. You know, that's the whole thing about getting involved with money. The more money you have, the more money you, you desire and covet after. You know, you just get yourself in a mess. You always want more and more and more. Incontinent, okay? Fierce. Yeah, we live in a fierce generation. They're 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 knock they're knock an old guy over the head just for views on TikTok or social media. <laughs> they're come up with a baseball bat. And, you know, back in the day, they would mug you, and they'd probably take your wallet. They don't even want well, your wallet. <laughs> they'd knock you over the head just, in, just so they get a laugh and while people are sitting there with their phones out so they get views on TikTok or whatever, whatever media. That's crazy. Fears. Punching you out for no reason. Despisers. How about this one? Despisers of those that are good. So you got people, you know, good, decent, good Christian people trying to stick up for what is right and what is good. They despise that. They hate that. If it was up to them, they'd want to kill you. They'd kill you. If you're actually verbal enough with your faith and stuff, they'd want to kill you. <laughs> okay, traitors. That's a big one. Turning, the back on, or turning your back on people. Brethren, you know, even Christians, you know, yeah, yeah, brother, I'm with you to the end. You know, next thing you know, where's he at? What happened to him? He's gone. <laughs> you know, traitors. Like Paul, he starts out, Paul and company, he ends up, only Luke was with me. Traitors. All right, heady. That means everything's up here. Everything, just just knowledge, heady. Just you know, and here it goes with high-minded. Yeah, I guess you could go take that two ways. People are all doped out all the time too. High, high, high-minded. High all right, lovers of pleasure. See that lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. So they may even claim, yeah, I believe God. And I, I, matter of fact, I love God, but they love pleasure more than God. So they fall into that category. And we, verse 7, ever learning. How about that, verse 7? Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. We got the internet. And I know that's, there's wickedness on the internet. There's, there's things you could learn. You could, you could get a, a degree off, of, off the internet. You could learn how to do, in a way, you can learn how to do almost anything off of the internet. <laughs> DIY projects and, you know, and YouTube and how to fix this thing on the car. You could learn a lot off, off the internet. But some people, they learn, they learn, they learn, but they never are able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Where are you going to find that? In this Bible. Okay? So, the uh, list continues. Uh, let's go to, let's go to uh, chapter 4 now. Okay? Here's another mark in the last days. Chapter 4. All right, look at verse number 1. Paul says, I charge thee. That's a, you know, I like that word, charge. That's a, that's a, that word's like a battle attack. A charge. I charge thee. Therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, that's alive, the quick and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom. Okay, so this is in context of, uh, of, of, of the latter days also. We'll keep reading. Preach the word. Okay, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering in doctrine. Now, I, you know, I'd look at this a couple ways. Preach the what? Preach the word when I'm holding in my hands. Be instant, on the spot, in season, out of season. It, you know, it don't matter if it's fall, winter, springtime, whatever. It don't matter what, what the general culture of the, of the world's going. You're, it doesn't matter if preaching may seem to be out of season right now. You're still to be preaching, okay? Preaching the, preaching the word of God. And, um, you know, some people, here, let me just keep reading. Look, it says reprove, reprove, that's, what's that, that's negative, okay, rebuke, that's negative, exhort, that's positive, with all long suffering, in a way that's negative, in doctrine, okay, so a lot of, when it comes to preaching the word, a lot of it is going to come off kind of 
negative sounding. It's going to kind of sound. It's going to so kind of sound sharp, and it because that's what reproof and rebuke is, and it's that's what correction is, and what to doctrine. What's doctrine? Things that the Bible teaches. Now look at verse three. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Okay, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So where does the doctrine come from? It comes from preaching the book, and they won't endure preaching. Okay, so what happens when somebody doesn't endure preaching? Well, they, they heap to themselves in heaps, a bunch of them, teachers, you know, having itching ears. In other words, they just want to have their ears tickled. They just want to hear what pleases them instead of actually what they need from what God's saying. So just the, the ear tickling, you know, preachers and stuff. And the old saying is all the all this sugar preaching is is leading to truth decay. <laughs> and that's the truth, you know. You, you water stuff down, you're 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 not upholding the truth. It's decaying, it's falling, it's falling down. They just want to hear cuddle me and coddle me and make me feel good. And you know, if you want to build a big, big church in this generation, in the last generation, then that's what you do. You talk sweet to them all the time. And you coddle them and you you know, tell them, you know, just tell them how nice they are and tell them everything's going to be all right. Tell them constantly, God loves you, God loves you. And, you know, sing them the Barney song, I guess, you know, and, and, and smile all the time. And you end up, you know, everybody will love you. End up having a big, a big work going on. And that's what this, that's what this generation is. They, this generation, it cannot, it cannot stand, it can't endure, put up with real sound doctrinal Bible preaching. They can't endure it. They have no endurance to the truth you know people you know imagine people say this you know you mean you come to church and and and, and listen to some nobody preach for one hour <laughs> you come to, with, with no tv screen going with no sound and light crew with no music crew and no theatrical plays and you come there and you sit at least two hours a week and listen to somebody preach the bible that's like that's you know that's my, my pastor has movie nights <laughs> you know my 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 pastor he, he brought his barber into the church and the barber's cutting his hair while the pastor's preaching a sermon. <laughs> Real, true story. <laughs> true stuff. My pastor sets up a whole skit and he's throwing, he's throwing eggs and he's pouring syrup over the Bible and he's doing all... What are these people doing? What are they... You know, oh, he's doing an illustration. An illustration? So you, got, you had to set up all this stuff and you're pouring syrup over the Bible and you're, you're tossing eggs on walls or whatever? <laughs> You know, it's it's crazy. My my pastor has a Super Bowl service, and she kicks the Bible off the stage. <laughs> what is that? You know, what, what what is all that stuff? I mean, you know why all that stuff goes down in the last days is because they have no endurance for the truth. When we think of endurance, we think of sports and lifting and you know working and doing hard physical things. There, you got to have some spiritual endurance. Spiritual endurance. They, and that, that's what happens. You're not going to endure the truth. The whole, uh, big, a big blame is Hollywood and the TV entertainment industries. You bl you bl it ruined people. And that's why a lot of you may struggle to pay attention for one hour. You've been ruined by TV and social media. Been ruined. You know, and you say, no, it's just because you're boring. <laughs> you know, well, guess what? Not all life is all about fun and games all the time. <laughs> He said, I'd rather be out doing some type of fun activity. It's not all fun activities all the time. <laughs> okay, that's, that's not it. I, you know, I'm not going to ride around here on some unicycle and juggle balls up in the air while I'm trying to you know, talk about Jesus or something like that as I go around in a circle. I'm not going to do that stuff. Okay? That's, that's, that's not the foolishness that Paul was talking about when he said, you know, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. That's not the full being, you know, looking like a fool up there. No, okay, that's, you got to, you got to, you have to have spiritual endurance, okay? So look, let's come to Second Peter, another mark of the last days, all right? An another mark. So in the last days, people aren't going to endure sound doctrine. They're not going to want to hear no preaching. They're not going to care about the truth at all. Here's another one. All right, we can add this to the list. Second Peter chapter 3. All right, Second Peter chapter 3. Now, like I says, you know, this, this, this may come off, it kind of comes off negative, and, and people don't want to hear this. And I, and I know a lot of you, you guys love the truth, and you're with me on it, but some people, they can't stand this, this type of truth. They can't stand it. And uh, 
you think about it, if you fill your system with garbage all the time, when the truth comes to you, or however it's dished out to you, when the truth comes to you, it just hits like a block wall of garbage. Because you've been filling yourself with garbage. You've got to get through that garbage wall and, and pierce, you know, your, your soul and spirit. And, uh, you know, people are so full of themselves that when truth actually is given to them and give it to them in a plain, easy way to understand, you know, they, what do they say most of the time? They say, oh, you're offending me. Oh, you're, you know, you're judging me. You know, how, how, can you, how can you talk to me like that? You don't love me. Well, you know, I actually, I actually love you more than you actually know. Just telling it to you plainly and giving it to you how, how it, it needs to be given. All right, look at, look at uh, first, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 1. This second epistle, beloved. <laughs> See, Peter, Peter loves the people he's talking to, right? Beloved. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds, by which, by way of remembrance. There's a good one. In order to keep your mind pure, you've got to remember what the Word of God says. How can you keep your mind pure if you just walk out of here and forget what the Word of God says? You never will keep your mind pure. I stir up your pure minds by which way of remembrance, uh, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. Do you, you, ever, you ever read actually what the prophets say in the Old Testament? Read some of them. Go through the book of Jeremiah. Go through uh, you know, Samuel and Isaiah and Zechariah. Go through the, just go through the prophets and see how they're constantly rebuking. Negative, 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 rebuking, rebuking, correcting. God's going to do this to you, king. If you, don't, you know what the kings in, did in, of Israel to their prophets? They killed them <laughs> or they tossed them in jail. Or they silenced them because they didn't, they didn't want, they didn't want the, the, the actual truth of God to be preached. They tried silencing them. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. All right, so, so what's, what's the deal here? Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, that's what we're talking about, the last generation, in the last days, scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Yeah, I've been hearing, imagine this. Imagine people who have been in Baptist churches preaching a second coming. I've been hearing this stuff for 70 years. Christ is coming back. Christ is coming. He ain't, he ain't coming back. I'm losing hope. Christ ain't coming back. No, you should get more, you should get excited. You should get more stirred up. You know, so some of the stuff we're new in the Bible believing movement. We, you know, I've been saved for five years, hearing Christ is coming back. What about some of you been been hearing Christ is coming back for thirty years, possibly? <laughs> you know, but it, what, here's what you're going to see in the last days. They're going to say, "Where's the promise of His coming?" For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. So in the last days, there's going to be scoffers, like what you know, pst, you know, a hell. <laughs> There is no hell. We, hell we, who believes in a hell anymore? <laughs> you know, Jesus Christ, you know, who wants, to, who wants to hear about Jesus Christ anymore? You know, what about coming to church, listening to, the, listening to Bible preaching, things like that? Who wants, to, who wants to deal with any of that? They're, they're looking at us a bunch of weirdos. I'd rather just sit home and scroll on my phone, <laughs> you know, or watch whatever on, uh, online. I don't got time to hear about that stuff. And here, you want to know the good news? All scoffers do is they just prove the Word of God. They just prove... The Word of God. Now, there's an old story about an old lady who didn't have nothing to eat in her house, okay? And she was down on the living room floor, and she was praying, Oh, God, please send me three loaves of bread. Please send me three loaves of bread. Please send me three loaves of bread. Uh, if you send me these loaves of bread, this, will, this is all I need. It'll last me the whole week. And she's down there praying day after day after day, and there's you know, three skeptics walk by her door, okay? And they hear... Oh, there's that crazy old lady again. You know, they're snickering and hitting each other. Look at that crazy old lady. She's praying that God's going to give her... God's going to give her actual bread, you know. And then one of the guys, you know, he says, you know what, I got an idea. Here's what we can do. We could go down to the store. We could buy three loaves of bread. We could go get a ladder. We could climb up her house. And then we could go throw down the chimney three loaves of bread. And, 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 and then she'll, she'll think that God sent her bread down from the sky. That's a good, you know, buddies. Yeah, let's do it. That sounds like a good idea, you know. So they go, they go down the store. They buy the three loaves of bread. And they, they get a ladder. They, you know, they... Go up there, and the whole time you could hear this lady, God, please send me three loaves. God, I need this bread. God, please feed my family. Feed my family. They get the ladder. They go up on the, on the roof. They take the three loaves of bread, 
plop it right down the living room floor as that old lady's just sitting down there praying, I need three loaves of bread, I need three loaves. Next thing you know, she gets the bread, drops right down on the, uh, right down through the chimney. And, you know, would you know that lady, she's shouting, she's running around, she's praising God, giving glory back to God, and, you know, thank you, hallelujah, Lord, and all that. And uh, next thing you know, these three skeptics, they, they knock on the door, and, they, you know, she's still, she's still shouting, hallelujah, praise the Lord. You know, they knock on the door, she comes and answers, still praising the Lord, still shouting. And uh, she they, uh, opens the door and says, hey, listen here, lady, God didn't send you that bread. We, we did that. We went down to the store. We bought it with our own money. We climbed up on your house. We dropped it down your chimney. God didn't do that. Okay? He didn't do that. We did that. And she's still praising the Lord. Praise God. You know, amen and all that stuff. She just kept shouting hallelujah. And they tried saying it again. Lady, we did that. And you know what she said? She said, glory to God. God still sent it even if a devil did bring it. <laughs> God still sent it, even if a devil did bring it. And that's, a, that's a good one, you know. And, and I'll tell you, look, it honestly, it doesn't matter how God does it. He'll do it. He does it. And, and God, God will take a, a whole bunch of skeptics and a whole bunch of scoffers, and he'll actually fulfill his word. So next time somebody says to you, you know, God, oh, Jesus Christ ain't coming back, you say, glory to God. That's exactly what the Bible said you'd say. <laughs> You're right? That's Because that's, that's what it says. No, in this verse, that in the last days, scoffers, shall walk after their own lusts, okay? Now, Peter tells you why. He tells you why they're scoffing. Um, you know, why don't they want Jesus Christ to come back? You can you imagine that? Why, why wouldn't you want Jesus Christ to come back? Because they want to walk after their own lusts. That's why. And, uh, you know, they, they want to pretty much live like hell. They want to scoff at the Bible, scoff at the second coming of Christ, and that's the mark of the last generation, okay? So, we're in a generation now that... Churches can care less about the second coming of Christ. Even, ba even Baptist churches could care less, you know, very far out, liberal ones, whatever. They don't care about the second coming of Christ. They just want to walk after their own lusts. So think about this. Once Adam and Eve, they walked out of that garden into a, a sin, a sin curse uh, generation, a sin curse world. It's, it's just been generation after generation for 6,000 years just continuing Okay, this generation comes up, another one passes, and this one comes up, another one passes. They're all marching their way to the grave. And we're getting, we're, I believe, we're on the last generation. From all those generations all the way back to, to Adam. So as I'm trying to preach to this, to this generation, just let me tell you something, though. Is you're responsible for your generation. You're responsible for it. And you need to, you need to be responsible for it, and you need to stand up for it. You say, well, I'm only a teenager or whatever. Yeah, we need some teenagers. You say, well, you know, I'm in secular school. Praise the Lord. God needs some people in secular school to witness. You know, and there's a bunch of pervs and dope heads running around in darkness and, you know, uh, they, you know they don't like it and all that, but you, they need somebody to, to kind of pull them out of the mess that they're in. And look, I, I would have been in the same mess. If it wasn't by the grace of God, I would have been in the same mess. You know, and... Uh, People, it's just, I guess, I don't know, people nowadays, they just don't seem to care about anything when it comes to God and His Word. They're talking about, you know, you hear, you know, who's Taylor Swift dating and stuff, or do you hear the latest Eminem song? Who cares? What's that going to, what's that going to do for me? What's that going to do for my, you know, eternity? You know, there's nothing, there's no, there's no weight to that. You know, and I think about that, you know, I, I got the Word of God to read, I got the hymns of old to sing, I got, I got the, I got the, an amazing, glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to talk about. I got a relationship with the Creator. I got the Holy Spirit to help me try to live a life that's holy. What's what does what does Eminem and Taylor Swift have to do with any of that? <laughs> it has nothing to do with none of that. So you know, not all just all, all that stuff that you hear about in the world, that small talk type of stuff. Just it's all kind of down in the dumps. And I like to hear stuff that's meaningful. Has has it, like the Bible says, an eternal weight of glory to it that's good that's good stuff okay that's good stuff and you say well all them people they're billionaires and they got all the money in it you know did did i forget to tell you who my father was he owns the universe he made the universe <laughs> you know i mean come on you know and, and, and I, I have an eternal inheritance and glory i mean I, I uh you know i'm joint hair with christ i'll be rolling and reigning with him that can't be anything 
that with a, with a billionaire has. Money can't buy that stuff. So I want to kind of close with a thought here. Come to Acts 13. This will be the last passage we look at. You owe your generation something. You owe your generation something. Look at, look at Acts chapter 13. Look at verse number 35. Acts 13, 35. Wherefore, okay, I believe Peter's preaching here. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, okay, speaking about King David, wherefore he saith also in another psalm, thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation. I'd like you to underline that, highlight that, whatever. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, circle that, square that, box that, whatever, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. So think about that, okay? You see what David did there, right there in that verse? He served his own generation. And that's what you ought to be doing. That's, that's what, you know, you, you're, you've got to be committed to serving this last generation, okay, to your generation. I, look, I can't do nothing about generations in the past. They're gone. They're long gone, all right? They, they can't be helped. They already finished their march to the grave, and they went off into heaven or hell. It's done for. But you can do something about your generation. You can serve it for the truth's sake and for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how many generations there's been since Adam. We know from Adam to Jesus is, was 77. That's given in, in Jesus' chronological, in the books of Matthew and stuff, 77 generations. That's, that's 4,000 years, okay? Now, we're all the way over here at the very end until the rapture happens. We're going, on to, we're going close to 2,000 years. So I think there's been about, I don't know, probably 177 generations. I can't do nothing for them 176 generations. I could do something for the last one, though. And so can you, the very last generation. Uh, you, you know, you, you can. You should, you should influence your generation. And the question is, what are, you, what are you going to influence them to do? Well, you're going to try to influence them to be like those that we read about in 2 Timothy chapter 3? We shouldn't. We shouldn't. And, you know, another thing, it's kind of, there's, there's a lot of emphasis kind of placed on, like, physical heredity. Uh, Physical hereditary stuff, you know, type of things. Like, you know, my grandparents or great-grandparents or my dad or whatever, you know, I was brought up like this. Quit blaming them. Qu forget about the past generations. What are you doing right now? The Holy Spirit of God can overcome, could break all the bondage and all the shackles from what was maybe passed down through your previous generations. You can't use that as, as an excuse to serve your generation. David could have said, man, David, he's way out here. Where is, where's David? He's about, uh, he's, he's out here. Okay, David could have said, man, all my generation was wicked. They, they did stuff in the wilderness. They, they, you know, they, all my generation is a bunch of wicked devils. David would have never served his generation if he was counting on what his great, 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 great granddaddy did or did not whatever do. You know? So you can't do that. And so some of the best soldiers from, for Jesus Christ, they do come from broken homes and people that did jail time and people that you know, didn't have the best up, upbringing. And maybe they might have been raised like some animal, but when they when they when they came to Lord Jesus Christ and became a man, they shook all that stuff off and they served their generation. So it's it's your it's your choice. You have a choice to make. Okay, you you alone are responsible for your sins, and whether you're going to yield yourselves servant to sin or servant to righteousness. Romans chapter six talks about that. And you say, well, yeah, you know, but I have I have these certain tendencies or whatever. Yeah, they're called sins. That's what they are. That's their, their sins. And blame yourself for them, okay? And confess them to God. Uh, and repent of them. Forsake them. Turn from them. And grow up in the Lord and serve your generation. Take, your, take responsibility. So that's, you know, 2 second, uh, second Timothy, uh, Timothy 4.7. Let me see. 2 Timothy 4.7. I, I do like this one. Paul says this. He says, For I am ready to be offered... For the time of my departure is at hand. Paul's about to die. All right, He knows his, he got a death sentence coming up for his faith. He's, but look what he says. I have fought a good fight. 
That's what the Christian life is like. It's never easy. It's always hard to do right. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, shall, uh, which the, Lord the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not unto me only, but to, unto all them that love his appearing. I like that what Paul says. I have fought a good fight, kept the faith, finished the course. Back in the old days, the Greeks would carry those torches, all right? You get the Olympics and stuff. They'd carry the torches, and they would, they would, uh, they would pass it down as they're racing. They'd hand the torch off to the other guy. The other guy would grab the torch and run with it. That's a, what's it? It's a relay race, I think. A relay race. Nowadays, they, they use like a baton or whatever, and they hand the baton off and things like that. But Paul, he ran the race. He, he got as far as he could get in his life, okay? And what, what did he do at the end of it? He handed it off to young Timothy. He's writing to Timothy here, okay? Uh, another, another minister in the faith. So he handed it off to Timothy. But you got to notice something is Timothy actually picked it up and he ran with it, okay? So somebody could be sitting here, take the torch, take the torch. And what, what do they do? They don't take it. They let it drop. In the, the, the light of the torch, it goes out because <laughs> you let it drop. You didn't, you didn't take it. And you're at the end and it's, you know, it's your, you're up. It's being passed to you. What are you going to do with it? You know, what are you going to do? You either, you know, stick your hand out and say, I'm going to take what you're, what you're saying. I'm going to take it and then I'm going to, I'm going to go with it. I'm going to preach it. I'm going to, I'm going to keep it, you know, and, and people, they don't, they don't care about their generation, whether it, they continue in sin, they're in the bondage of sin, they, they just, you know, they're, they don't care if their generation drops off into hell. I'm, I mean, geez, I'm, I'm not just preaching to you, I'm preaching to me too. You know, what's, what's, what's the deal? People dropping off into hell, damned for all eternity. And, uh, you know, most people, you know, God forbid if anybody in here, most people, they drop the torch. They get it passed to them. They might grab it for a second, but then they drop it. They don't fight. They don't keep going, you know. And last days, perilous times shall come. So it's time to pick up the torch, run with it. And I like what the Bible says, you know. It, there's all these analogies. The Bible says, let us run, let us run with patience. Uh, the race that is set before us, and wh what's our finish line? Jesus Christ. It says, looking, uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's our finish line, keeping our eyes on Him. Because what? You take, you take your eyes off Him, you put it on the world, you put it on the troubles around you, you're liable to fall. But you keep your eyes on Jesus, it'll keep you going, you know? The, the, the light of all life. So, um, I'll tell you this much. It may not, oh, here's a good, a good exhortation for the last generation. You may not have to run 50 years. Some saints have been running or in living in the Christian life for a long time. All right, Third, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. I've been, in this for, I've been in this battle for a long time. And then we squeak in in the last hour of the church age. We might only have a, a couple years <laughs> to run the race. A couple years. <laughs> You know what? And, then, and that makes reminds me of that thing. The Lord's going to reward you. Those, those that squeaked in in the last hour of work, they're going to get rewarded just like them people that have been working for 50 hours. Remember that whole thing, the parable of the talents? He paid the guy the same amount of them people that have been working that whole day. And you, people say, that's unfair, it's unfair. It's God's money. He could pay however you want to pay. And you agreed to a penny a day. I paid them a penny a day for eight hours of, of work. You got on a job at the last minute. I'd, yeah, I'd be upset. <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't, you know, building up, busting your back, you know, a guy comes up, you're block laying and all that, I'll come and clean your tools, give me a full price, you know, <laughs> I'll come and clean for you guys, you know, you'd be like, get out of here, but when God says that, he, it's his money, he'll give you what you agreed to, and he'll still reward you, just the same, and when we're living in the last generation, okay, so we might not have, have that long to actually go, so look at the rest of it, and back to Acts here, I'm going to finish expounding this passage, Acts chapter or this verse. Don't worry, I'm almost done. Acts chapter 13, verse 36. Acts 13, 36. Look what it says. For David, after he had served his own generation. Now, you got this is important though. How, how did he serve his generation? By the will of God. So God has a will for how you are to serve your generation. So the question is, are you, are you blowing it? Are you just letting it just go to waste? He has a will for each and every one of us how we are to actually serve our generation. 
It says, by the will of God. Somebody needs to tell them the truth. You know, and fewer people are doing it. It's a shame. People are being lied to from the cradle to the grave. Constant lies. And people aren't going to get the truth. It's going to be hard for them to get the truth through the media or whatever. You know, they're... And look, you can't reach... I understand you can't reach hundreds and millions of people, but that's, that's how they're dying. They're dying by the hundreds and millions uh, uh, every day. So I think, it's, I think it's worth every single track that you give out. Every single person that you tell about the Lord, it's, it's worth it. It's worth it. You, see, you know, they're, they're going to make fun of you and scoff at you, but it's worth it. And, I th and it's worth doing anything you can, obeying the will of God. That's what we're doing. We're trying to do that right now, obeying the will of God, coming to church, hearing the word preached. In a way, that's serving your generation. You know, imagine that. You know, hey, man, man what you doing tonight? You want to hit the bar? Now I'm going to church. <laughs> For what? Why are you, what, are you going, what are you going to church? I'm going to listen to some Bible preaching. You want to come? <laughs> you know, ima imagine that. You know, you, take, you actually take a stand, forgetting about all that stuff, coming here, listening to the Word of God being preached, and, not, and actually trying to at least take some of it and walk out the door with it. That's serving your generation. It, it is. So you, you just you won't ever go wrong with serving or surrendering your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, think about can can you can you see a great need uh, for for this generation? Can you at least see the need? Honestly, there's a need, okay, and it's 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 in complete darkness. All right. Now, I like this last thing here. I like his last what he says here is after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep he fell on sleep <laughs> now that's kind of great you know I, I, I love the, the king james bible all right how the word and how it says he fell on sleep you think about that that statement he fell on it all right did you ever you ever work a hard day and just see that mattress and you just fall on that thing <laughs> or you see the couch you kick off the boots it's, you know their clothes are still dirty man i can't wait to get back on the couch and you just plop right on the couch you fall on the couch <laughs> You know, kick off them boots. You know, didn't even get a shower yet or whatever. You you fall on that stuff. And uh, David, he, what he's not talking about, he's not talking about taking a nap here. He's talking about dying. That's what he's talking about. David fell on it. It was like a relief to him. And you know, I'm usually pretty tired after Bible study nights, and you know, I'm worn out and want to go want to go home. And you know, uh, I, I, but in a way, I want to I want to go home kind of worn out. It's you it's get a better night's sleep doing doing something for the Lord. I wanna, I wanna fall on sleep like that, fall on sleep. You know, but but here's what happened. He fell on sleep, but it meant that his body had to see corruption. In other words, how did he get that final rest? He had to die first. That's what happened. He had to die. So if you're if you're deathly afraid of falling on sleep, in other words, dying, uh, why, why? Unless if you're not serving your generation by the will of God, you know, and after a long day's work, you know, you're like, all right, it's time to go to, uh, time to, go to sleep. I can't wait. You're not like, oh, man, I got to go to bed now, you know, <laughs> after a long day's work. You're not like that. Well, that's, that's how it would be with death. Imagine, you know, you've done all you can. You serve God. The time comes. You'll be like, man, thank God. Praise the Lord. I can't wait to lay this carcass down and just fall on sleep. <laughs> you know, I just can't wait. And that's what David did. So it was like corruption for his body. It meant relief for his soul. That's what it meant. So death for a Christian and serving your own generation, serving the Lord Jesus Christ, it's, it's, it's not some wrestling match with the angel of death Okay, on your deathbed. It shouldn't be like that. Uh, it's, it's, it's not some terror. It should be actually a, re a relief to just fall on sleep like that. It should be a relief. Sleep is a great thing. I was uh, reading a, a story of a missionary named David Livingston. Back in the 1800s, he was a missionary to Africa. And he's in his hut, and he's praying, okay? And his servants were coming in. They were checking on him. He's down, and he's kneeling by his bedside. He's praying. And after some time, his, 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 uh, his servants were like, what's going on? He's been in there for, for hours. What's, what, what's wrong with our master, you know? They walk in. He died. <laughs> he's dead. He died in the, in the position of prayer, <laughs> You imagine that's a that's a way to go out if, if you're ever going to go out a way that's a that's a great way to go out on that position and he just you know you just go straight from in a stance of prayer praying to God you in the next thing you know you fall on sleep in your eternal rest that's a way to go you know and that's that's amazing so if they were to put what do they call those uh, uh, the, your final things on the gravestone 
uh, the epit epitaph. Okay, an epitaph. Yeah, if they were to put a, if they were to put an epitaph on your gravestone, and it was an actual, an honest epitaph, not something that you wrote up here. When I die, I want I want my gravestone to say this. You know, he was the greatest man, greatest husband, greatest preacher, greatest. No, an honest one. Okay, what could your could your epitaph on your gravestone? Couldn't it say he served his generation by the will of God? That'd be a good one. Could it could it say that? You know, and. Uh, that would be great, you know, and and I, and I don't want to I don't want to roll over anybody or anything like that. I I, I want to run and I want to get tired, and I want to do what I can do till the end of the load, end of the road with every last breath that I have, huffing and puffing at the finish line, holding that torch up, and saying, "Here, somebody take it, somebody else take it," okay. And uh, one day I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna fall on sleep if the Lord tarries. If you don't come back, I'll fall on sleep too. And, but at the end of the day, when I fall asleep, I want to be broken and tired and spent and just have, have my arm held out still holding the torch. Like old Moses, you know, he's holding his hands up the whole time during battle. Yet, thank God he had two buddies there to hold his arms up the whole time as they were prevailing. As long as Moses held his arms up, Israel prevailed in the war. <laughs> you know, just keep your arm held up. It don't matter if you're 120 years old. <laughs> you keep that arm, that arm held up. Get, keep that, that torch up like that. And um, I'm gonna fall on sleep. Just be like a, just be like my bed at home. You know, I can't wait. Lay on my bed tonight. I'm gonna be. I can't wait, man. I'm gonna go home to lay down with the Lord. You know, I want to be ready for it. And uh, I know. And, and I, I'll, I'll never be ready for it. And you'll never be ready for it if you constantly keep your mind on yourself. And if I constantly keep my mind on myself, that's not the way to do it. Um, you know. And Paul says this. He says, "I die daily." He, 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 di he died to himself in order to serve the Lord and to serve others. So what's your, uh, what's your gravestone going to say? And there's, there's so many that are out there in the world that, that need the truth. And they do care for the truth. And some of you here have been actually handed something. And, uh, you know, m millions of young men and young women, they haven't been handed what you're, what you're actually handed. And I didn't get, I didn't have the truth at 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. You know, I heard about Jesus Christ. I heard about the Bible. I never personally received it, actually believed it, trusted it for myself. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't care for it. But something was, was handed to me at 22 years of age. 22 years. You know, I, I, I finally got a hold of, I'm a sinner, man. I better trust solely on what Christ did for me. I better pick up that book, get into it. And uh, I feel like I owe my generation, the best I can give them. And uh, the, what's the best I can give them? The truth. That's it. And, uh, you know, people, it's, it's sad. You know, people, they, they can't stand it. And it'll, it'll break your heart when you give people the truth and they just, they just scoff at you. Sometimes you feel like you want to grab them up and say, you, you, do you understand what I'm talking about here? You know, like this is the severity of what I'm actually saying. Just stop and think. Think about, what I what I'm saying, you know, you're a sinner, you you know, you will be paid back with your sin from death, and God came down as a man. He took He took your sins upon Him, and all He's asking you to do is receive the free gift of salvation, or else you have to pay for your sins in hell. That's sad. So what what are you going to do with the truth that you've been handed to? Okay, most I hope not people in here, but most are going to they're going to the torch is going to be extended, and they're going to let it. They're going to it's going to flop. You know, it, like like the saying, you know, tr truth just gonna fall in the streets in a, in a bad way. <laughs> you got the truth, and you got the it's passed on, and you just let and you let you let it drop. You let the light go out. So, um, hope you don't do that. Hopefully, you will pick up the torch, the truth, and continue to carry carry it to the finish line. So, which one you're gonna be? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you so much, Lord, for giving us the truth, Lord. This is a like we talked about last week, even in our study, Lord, this is a filthy and dark, perverse nation, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a book. Thank you, Lord, for the torch that has been passed on to us, Lord. And we, we owe the generation that we're in with the truth, Lord, that we've been handed. And we're in a, we're in a line, Lord, that goes clear back to the New Testament times. And you, when you gave us the truth, Lord, you, you called me out of a dark, dark world, Lord. You called me out of a wicked lifestyle with no truth. Just damnation. You you picked me up for some reason, Lord, and I fully I fully don't understand why. But Lord, I do owe you for giving me the light, and 
I, I look at all the, the poor souls that are around us and without the truth and total darkness and some have actual hatred toward the truth, Lord. And if there be anybody who is listening who does not know where they're going when, they're, when they die, if they haven't called upon you for salvation, Lord, I pray that tonight will be the night not to put it off any longer. I pray, Lord, that they understand that they have sinned against you and that they trust that you died for their sins according to the Scriptures and that you were buried and resurrected the third day, Lord, to save their soul from hell. And the Bible says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Lord, I pray that any lost sinner comes to the Savior, and that they uh, come out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that you speak to this last generation here. Maybe you can raise up some young men, young women, that will serve their generation by the will of God. And Lord, this... Uh, this really does look like the last generation, Lord. I believe it is with all my heart. and Just may they pick up the truth. May I pick, keep the truth and continue to run with it. And may the older men and older women also keep running, Lord. Keep running. And uh, quit talking about being too old or too tired. And just keep running, Lord, till we can fall on sleep. Lord, help us to surrender. And we know that uh, you'll give us what we can handle, Lord. And you'll give us the ability to do what you would have us to do, Lord, to serve our generation. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Alrighty. Well, anything for verse memorization? Any any particular verse? Did we I believe we did for Second Timothy. Um Julie, you wanna cut cut the microphone?